The Variety Artist, episode 27. This one's all about creating memorable characters and being booked as a family entertainer year round. Make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your phone or mobile device. It really helps me a lot. Today's podcast is brought to you by audible.com. They're offering you, the Variety Artist, a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at thevarietyartist.com slash book. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Just go to thevarietyartist.com slash book right after this podcast and get your free audiobook. Now, let's start the show. Welcome to The Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. My guest today has performed for Pamela Anderson, James Cameron, Snoop Dogg, Whoopi, Tommy Lee, Natalie Portman, Shaq, Steven Spielberg, and many more. He's a master of creating memorable characters for the family audience. Over the past 25 years, he's performed at over 10,000 events. Variety artists, I give you magician David Scale. Hey, hey, John. What's going on, Dave? Not much. Just kind of hanging out, talking to you, my friend. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, full disclosure, Dave is a friend of mine. We met 20 years ago? Yeah, gosh, it would have been. Yeah, it must have been about 20 years ago when we really actually had a conversation. I think the first time I met you was a library showcase in 1999. Yeah. That, uh, no, it was the 2001 one because it was the space theme. Oh, okay. Was it 2001? Yeah, that was the first time I remember you. It's only been a measly 17 or 18 years. <laughs> and we haven't changed a bit. That's right. <laughs> I do remember seeing you at the showcase. One showcase, we did it. Remember the superhero showcase? <laughs> I do. It was a library superhero showcase, and I had planned this great crazy routine where I was going to rip my shirt off and become Spider-Man and I have the Spider-Man outfit underneath my shirt. I'm getting ready to go. And I look over at Dave and I was doing a whole super demo where I rip away my entire outfit with a custom designed superhero outfit on underneath. Exactly. Both of us have the same idea. Great minds. <laughs> okay. So for people who don't know you, Dave, do you live by yourself? I know you have a couple of dogs. I have two German Shepherds. I've got two bunny rabbits, which are working rabbits because I am a magician, mm -hmm. and a pond full of koi fish. And one of my favorite stories of yours is with the bird and the koi fish. Oh, yeah. So tell us what happened there. <laughs> oh, early on when I uh, lived in my house, there used to be a heron, a large three-foot bird, and one day I'm looking out my window and I see this beautiful bird sitting in my koi pond. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And then bam, he eats one of my fish. Oh no. <laughs> and it's like, what? He just ate my fish. My first German shepherd at the time, she was young. She was uh, you know, an adolescent puppy. And it became a battle between her and this bird where the bird would land in my backyard. And one day I was watching the, Zoe was her name, and she was sitting behind the pond and she got up and they looked at each other for the first time about five feet apart. And you could see the bird was almost the same size as her, but they had to figure out where they were on the food chain. And all of a sudden, Zoe got it. I'm the dog. And she starts barking at the bird and the bird leaves and I congratulate her. And that became an ongoing issue. At six in the morning, the bird would show up. My dog would go out there and bark. My neighbors would get ticked off because my dog's barking. And I'm saying, well, my <laughs> pond is under attack. And finally, I built the cage over the pond and the bird went away. <laughs> And your dog was like, what are you doing? Exactly. My dog's like, that was our game. <laughs> <laughs> now, on a personal level, you are also a black belt in jujitsu. Is that right? I'm a purple belt currently in jujitsu. I am a black belt in Shaolin Kempo and a black belt in Kaja Kempo, which is a similar style. All right. For people who don't know, what are, what are the different styles entail? I say Kempo is punch kick. Kaja Kempo is a lot more grab, breaking, and takedown, and then jujitsu is going to be grappling. Cool. And how long have you been doing that? Since I was 13. <laughs> as long as you've been doing magic. Exactly. Yeah, the two things I've done all my life, martial arts and, uh, and magic. And they both come hand in hand when I'm working with kids. 
when you first started doing this, you were using both, right? You were using your martial arts background and magic, not just for kids, but for a Ninja Turtle thing, right? Early on in my career, I was doing magic and clown shows. And that, back in the day, that was what everybody did. That was all there really was for parties. This would have been late 80s. Around 88, something major happened, and that was the Ninja Turtles. And they yeah. were the first huge character that everybody had to have. Now, before they took off, but when they were just starting to build up steam, my friend turned me on to them, and I remember thinking, that just sounds like fun. I've always wanted to use the size, which are a martial arts weapon that Raphael the Ninja Turtle uses, and it was the excuse I always had to put together a character and build a show around that. So I got myself a costume, I put an entire show together, and then the turtles took off. And, and the analogy I use is, I felt like I was the only kid in the ocean with a surfboard when the tidal wave hit. Oh, man. And then I became the Ninja Turtle guy, and all of the event planners were calling me, and I had to train other people to work under me, and the magic took a side line, and I was a full-time Ninja Turtle for years to come after that. And then that parlayed into Batman, Spider-Man, and a whole bunch of other superheroes. But that was the first one, and it was because I was the only guy who had a martial arts background who also knew how to entertain kids and that magic and all those other qualities that go into a good character performance. So all the stuff you were studying, they all came together. Exactly. I got to tell you this story. I have a Ninja Turtle story. Oh, yeah? Cowabunga? In the, I guess, late 80s or maybe maybe even early 80s, I was dating a girl that was working for Mattel that was on the committee to accept or reject toys and cartoons and characters and things. Before the Ninja Turtles were popular, the person, whoever it was that invented Ninja Turtles, came to Mattel and said, listen, I have this idea, this ninja, teenage mutant ninja turtle idea. And she was on the committee that said, nah, you know, that really doesn't sound like it'll be a big hit. That's probably a really good thing for her to keep off her resume. <laughs> you think? <laughs> I've seen your magic show a few times. What does just a, a standard Dave scale magic show look like? Well, my regular kids magic show is going to be a wacky, silly, goofy show where everything kind of falls apart. Nothing works right. I'm covering up my mistakes and the kids are yelling and screaming that they see what's happening. And then when everything seems hopeless, the magic finally works. I get fooled. They get fooled and just kind of a good, silly old time. So everything works out at the end. Theoretically. <laughs> what other than uh, children's stuff, what other things are you doing? Well, performance wise, I also do magic for adults. So I've got a comedy magic show that would be a parlor type show. I also do close up magic and, you know, strolling, walk around magic. And I do stage hypnosis. Oh. And then I also run picnic games for big corporate events. So that keeps you busy throughout the, the entire year, right? It does because everything's kind of seasonal. Picnic games is big during the summertime. The magic's big all year round because there's always birthday parties. Different character shows, which I know we're going to be getting into, which are popular during the holiday seasons. Yeah. Stage hypnosis is really big during graduation season because you've got the high school and college grad nights. Oh. And it's also really big during the uh, holiday season because a lot of corporations will have a hypnotist for the big corporate banquets. Oh. Well, let's go back to those grad nights. The hypnotism, is that real big for the grad nights? Huge during the grad nights. From mid-May to mid-June, that's pretty much all I'm doing in the middle of the night. What time is that? Usually anywhere from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. Oh, man. And then the next day, sometimes you'll have a, a kid's party? Yeah, that's the worst. I will do an all-night grad night for a high school because they do these high school lock-ins where they lock the kids in and keep the kids safe while they party for their graduation celebration. Mm. And I'll wrap up a show at maybe 4 in the morning, and then I'll have a 9 a.m. elementary school graduation. Oh, man. And some of them are out of town to where I will fly in from a different part of the state and land and go right from the airport to a gig. With no sleep? With no sleep. <laughs> And a bunch of kids going, hey, Dave, Dave, Dave. Yep. I actually had one night when I came in, I had an all-night grad night, and I pulled up in front of a birthday party that the next day, having had no sleep, 
And I got to the birthday party about a half hour early, so I pulled over and just relaxed and almost missed the show because I'd fallen asleep in front of their house. Oh, no. I woke up five minutes before. It's like, oh, I got to get in there. <laughs> <laughs> One time, I'm infamous for taking naps right before my shows do, and I always set my alarm on my phone. And one time I fell asleep at a park and I laid out a blanket and I'm thinking, oh, I have like, you know, two hours till I have to set up. It'll be fine. So I lay out a nice blanket at the park about a block away from the library that I'm performing at. And sure enough, I opened my eyes and all these kids are standing above me pointing. Isn't that the magician? Cause I have my animal shirt and the, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, hi, kids. How are you? <laughs> I wasn't late for the show, but uh, a lot of the kids saw me sleeping in the park. That's the show. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> well, let's get into your different characters. I love the names of your characters. Patty O. Furniture, Elvis Parsley. <laughs> yep. When you have a holiday coming up, and there's a lot of them coming up now. We have uh, Halloween coming up, and uh, Christmas is right around the corner. Where do you start? I think it starts with who is the character? What is his personality going to be look like? What is he going to look like? If you're doing a classic character like Santa, a lot of that's already pretty much figured out. So you mm -hmm. just have to figure out how can I achieve the way the world views that character. But if you're creating the character from scratch, then it becomes, how do I want this character to be? Yeah. And in my case, most of the time, they're a lot like me. And then once you figure out who the character is and what they're going to look like, then the next question is, why are they there? Why are they showing up at this party? What mm -hmm. is their motivation? And this actually goes back to those superhero days when I was doing superhero parties. Uh, my mentor, that was what he said is, why would Batman be showing up at a kid's party? Why would Ninja Turtle be showing up at a kid's party? So you got to create your motivation for why you're there. Otherwise, it's, hi, I'm Batman, let's play games, which there's a huge disconnect for. So why does a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle show up at a kid's birthday party? I would always come running into a birthday party looking for the bad guys. In uh, that case, it was the Foot Soldiers or Shredder, who are the arch villains of the Ninja Turtles. And I would run in looking for them and, asking the kids, did you see them? I was chasing after them. I thought they ran through here. Oh no, they got away again, rats. If only there were some kids who could help me figure out how to catch them, but where? And then you've set up the motivation, you've set up your reason for being there, and you've just set up a theme for, and a storyline for the party. And you create an entire history beforehand. Exactly. You're not just coming in there, they're cold. But then once you're there and you recruit the kids, now you've got your training. So. That can be games as part of their superhero training. And it can apply to any of the superheroes. The magic was always the same. It would be the same superhero magic tricks like me escaping from chains as I tell the story of how the bad guys captured me and I got away or punching my finger through a coin. If the character had a martial arts background, then I would do a martial arts demonstration. Mm -hmm. And I could do face painting as part of their superhero disguises. I used to irritate a lot of other performers because they would do all their major, they would do real face painting. And I was horrible at face painting. But I discovered Crayola sold these washable markers at the market. Mm. So I would just run to the market, grab these markers, and draw on the kids' faces. And it worked. It was cheesy, but it was quick. It was neat. It was cheap. And it crossed off face painting as part of my requirements of things I should be doing for a kid's party. There you go. And you could add that as, a... as, an, as an additional uh, feature. Right. And then I would do the uh, balloons. So the Ninja Turtles got their balloon weapons. They got their nunchucks. They got their samurai swords made out of balloons. Their bows, which was a big staff, which was basically a long balloon that was just inflated. And then I would teach them how to swing them around and use them. And they'd take their turtle oath. We go sing happy birthday to celebrate, take pictures, and then I'm off to chase the bad guys. That's really smart because you've set up the whole thing. You've set up the whole party at the very beginning. One of the toughest parts of opening any sort of magic show or whatever it is, is the opening. You know, hey, glad to see you. Glad you're here. Whoa, hey. Exactly. It's like, hi, I'm Batman. What do you guys want to do now? It doesn't fit. When you think about it, as long as you ask yourself, what's my motivation as a superhero, it's kind of obvious, but a lot of performers don't even start there. They don't even ask, why am I here? 
So let's move into St. Patrick's Day with Patio Furniture. So does he have a motivation? Well, of course. Well, usually Patio Furniture is going to be more school shows. I don't get a lot of private parties for that character, Mm -hmm. but I do get a lot of school events that want to do a St. Patty's Day celebration. Okay. As Patio Furniture, I'm a leprechaun, so I've (laughs) got to have my cheesy leprechaun accent. My character is, I'm looking for me lost gold. I'm going to figure out how to find me lost gold. Perhaps the children can become junior leprechauns. They can help me out. And this is going to be more of a magic show. Yeah. But the kids, they get to take the leprechaun oath. And then I explain about how we find coins from the air and we can find treasure just about anywhere. And I do a whole magic demonstration called the miser's dream where we produce coins from nowhere. And then I talk about how we have to hide the treasure. And I do a, some magic where I make the, the coin disappear. Mm-hmm. And the whole magic show is kind of built around the idea of me finding treasure and hiding treasure. I've seen your Halloween show with Count Dave. That's right. <laughs> like, I, I, was, I was driving back. I did a show in Coronado and I'm driving back and I see at the Coronado Library, David Scale starring as, you know, Count Dave for his Halloween show. And I'm like, Arr! And for your listeners who aren't aware, Coronado is a good couple hours away from both of us. So the yeah, fact that is. you and I ran into each other way out there is a really, really weird coincidence. It was. <laughs> so with Count Dave, you start out your Halloween show. How do you grab the background for that one? This one was a whole weird, different approach for a Halloween show. And this will be something that I hope your listeners can, can take in. I know a lot of performers, when they put together a Halloween show, especially magic shows, they will look for Halloween-themed tricks. They they want things that are just spooky, and they'll do a whole bunch of Halloween-themed tricks. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, Mm -hmm. except it's really hard to chain that together as a storyline. My Halloween show actually has very few Halloween-themed tricks, but it has a whole Halloween storyline. With that particular show... I have to have an ending and that's become a popular ending for a lot of my shows. The ending for most of my magic shows is my rabbit. Mm -hmm. So I need to figure out how am I going to incorporate him as the finale for the show. So in this particular case, I started with that. My rabbit's going to be the finale of my Halloween show. How is that going to be? Hmm. So I reverse engineered it. And what I came up with is I want to become the king of Halloween. And in order to become the king of Halloween, I've got to pass these magic tests. Mm. And I'm a bumbling vampire. I'm not a scary vampire. And I want to become the king, but I'm really, really bumbling. So all of the tests that I have to pass, I fail, but I don't think I fail. And then I theme them a little bit to the Halloween. So the first test is the test of fear. I've got to overcome my greatest fear. Well, what's a vampire's greatest fear? And I explain, werewolves. Mm -hmm. And I have this box. And I'd say, you don't think there's a werewolf in this box, do you? I hope not. And I open it up and there's a picture of Elmo. And I scream, no! (laughs) And the kids yell, it's Elmo. And I go, no, that was a werewolf. Did you see how scary he looked? Did you see those things? And the kids yell, it's Elmo. (gasps) I'm pretty sure Elmo means werewolf in Spanish. (laughs) (laughs) And then from there, we have to go into vanishing the werewolf. (laughs) And the whole show is all about me bumbling my way through these various tests as I attempt to become the king. The finale, getting back to the rabbit, is we learn whoever has passed all the tests, will uh, the power will be appear in the box. And it turns out to be the rabbit, who's the Easter bunny. And the Easter bunny gets to be the king of Halloween this year because he got bored with Easter and he wanted to add Halloween to his collection. And me, I'm relegated to being egg boy and I now have to hand out Easter eggs for Halloween. Nice. <laughs> But it's, it'll still fit your idea of theming a whole story around your character. Exactly. Yes. So my character is, I'm a bumbling vampire. I've got to be silly, not scary, because it's for kids. Right. I've got to be a little self-deprecating. And I've got to fail everything. The story arc is, I've got to pass tests in order to become the king. The finish of the story is, I don't become the king. The rabbit is as the Easter Bunny. So that's Halloween. How about this Elfus? How do you say it? Elvis Parsley? Elvis Parsley, the Christmas elf. And you know, a kid gave him up with that name. I was doing an elf magic show and the kid goes, are you Elvis Presley or something like that? And I go, it kind of sounded like Elvis Parsley. Oh, I am now. (laughs) (laughs) 
So does that keep you busy on Christmas? Yes. Elvis Parsley is a big one. In his case, he wants to help Santa out. He wants to become Santa's top elf. But the computers have gone down, and he decided to sneak away from the North Pole and get some kids to help us out in order to help save Christmas. Mm. So I'm still a bumbling character because pretty much most of my shows I bumble around. Yeah. But in this particular case, my motivation is I want to help Santa and I need to get the kids to join me and become junior elves. And the magic show is all about what it takes to become a, an elf. Mm. And then at the end, we produce the rabbit who is Santa's top bunny rabbit named Snowball. And the rabbit tells me that Santa has, that the kids have helped and they have helped save the day and Santa's proud of them and I get to be Santa's top elf. Nice. So once again, you start off with a, with a theme and a storyline coming in to the event. Exactly. And then the other thing I'll mention as part of all this is costuming. All of my costumes, in my case, are custom made. I have a seamstress who designs them. Vampire is pretty straightforward. It's a cape and a tuxedo shirt and a nice vest and a nice medallion. The elf it was a custom design elf costume. It looks like a tuxedo, but made out of green with a Santa, green Santa hat knickers so it's a very specially made elf themed costume my elf costume surprisingly to change my hat looks an awful lot like a leprechaun costume so that was elvis parsley uh you do santa also i do and what's funny about santa i have been doing santa since i was 16 years old oh i had a an event planner that i used to work with who let's just say his standards of quality weren't the highest well, you were 16 years old. And my standards of knowing better weren't the highest either. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me I'm getting a lot of calls for Santa. If you get a costume, I can get you some work. So at 16, I saved up my pennies and I bought the what I thought was a nice professional costume. In retrospect, it was what you would call your low-end consumer costume mm -hmm. with a fake beard that looked really cheesy. <laughs> oh. I started doing Santa gigs. My mentor, I had a mentor about a year later who really helped me up my game and he helped me buy a, a professional quality costume. He taught me how to age my face. So I would learn how to highlight and shade my, the makeup around my eyes to make them look wrinkled. Of course, I had to wear a lot of padding. Nowadays, none of that's a problem, but. <laughs> oh, the padding you mean? <laughs> the padding or the wrinkles. <laughs> What kind of gigs does Santa do? He's very traditional. You've got your corporate gigs, where it's really a lap sitting job, where Santa's going to sit there and have the kids visit, tell Santa whether they've been good or bad, tell Santa what they want for Christmas, pose for pictures, move on down the assembly line. Mm. But the ones I really enjoy are the private home parties, where Santa gets to walk in with gifts, get to visit the children, pass out the presents, take pictures, sing jingle bells, and off to the next one. Oh, how many can you do in a day? Depending on the time of the year, those are usually pretty short and sweet, you know, 20 minutes a pop. Huh. So Christmas Eve, I'll be doing, oh, I could do anywhere from, you know, five to 10 in an, in an evening, depending on how busy that, that particular year happens to be. And I actually have one customer who has been my customer since I started when I was 16. And I'm now on the third generation with that family. Oh, do you ever see pictures of yourself when you were 16 or 17 years old doing Santa for their family? It's crazy. And I told them, if I stick with this long enough, I have fantasies of being able to claim to be the longest working professional Santa in the world. Because nobody starts when they're 16. I know that there are guys who've been doing it for, you know, if you figure there are guys in their 80s who maybe started when they're in their 30s or 40s. So there are guys who have 40 to 50 years. Oh, that is true but there aren't going to be guys who started when they were 16. When you're 80. It's, I can't wait. Have you heard of this? I don't even know what it's called. Santa by Skype. Have you heard of this? I have not. Oh, this is a cool thing. One of my friends is doing. All you do is sit, sit in front of your computer and you put a Christmas background behind you. You make an appointment with a mom or a dad to have their kid go on Skype and talk to Santa for five or 10 minutes. And you can do it at home and they pay good money for it. Wow, that's interesting. That's a good way to make some money during Christmas time, huh? Yeah, that, that's amazing. 
Hmm. Hmm, Dave says. Hmm. All right, well, we're going to move into fact or something John just made up. Does that sound like fun? Dum, dum, dum. Is it fact? Ooh. Or is it something John just made up? Ah. So here's how it works. I'm going to read a headline and you're going to tell me if it's true and maybe tell me something about it or if it's something I just made up. Sound good? Sounds great. Here we go. First headline, Arnold Schwarzenegger went skinny dipping in front of Dave while he was dressing as Batman for his kids party. That is true. Oh, <laughs> what? okay, you gotta tell me the story. I was hired to be Batman and my buddy Jim, he was gonna be Robin. And we were at Schwarzenegger's estate, a huge, huge estate. And they had us in this private bungalow near the swimming pool getting dressed while the whole party was taking place on the tennis courts. So we're in there putting on our Batman outfit and Robin outfit and then walks Arnold. And I don't think he knew we were there. He just kind of walks in and he introduces himself and it's like, oh my gosh, here it is, my me and my buddy Jim talking to Arnold. And it was right after he'd been Mr. Freeze. So we're Batman for the real Mr. Freeze. Oh my. And he talks to us for a couple minutes, goes over to the pool, takes off his shirt, and we're just still kind of stargazing at him, turns around, drops his shorts, and jumps in. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what is the etiquette? Well, it's not looking this way. <laughs> And next thing you know, my buddy and I are staring at each other with this awkward expression as we're getting our costumes on with Schwarzenegger swimming naked right behind us. Like, All right, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> Wait, so it was his kid's birthday party? It was his kid's birthday party, yep. <laughs> so he's skinny dipping during his kid's birthday party. <laughs> yeah. Now, in his defense, the pool had this big shrubbery all around it, so it was really kind of a private block pool. So it wasn't like anybody was going to be able to walk and see, but... But yeah, it was still a little weird. <laughs> All right. Next, uh, next headline. Dave unwittingly performed a marriage ceremony as part of a scam. That is also true. I, unwittingly. Yep. I sometimes do telegrams. And I get these really bizarre requests for telegrams. And if you ever want to open yourself up creatively, open yourself to doing telegrams because they will be really, really wacky experiences. Event planner who told me that she had a couple that wanted to renew their wedding vows and they wanted to hire somebody to read their vows. And it was supposed to be their 30 year anniversary. Okay. So I'm like, okay, that sounds easy. So I accepted the gig and I was talking to the groom or the, 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 the husband beforehand and he said no that's a mistake we've been married for three months but we never had a ceremony oh. and I thought okay that's a little different but sure so I showed up wondering well if you're gonna have a ceremony why not hire somebody real but okay and when I got there the guy was a white guy in his 50s the bride was a young Asian woman who didn't speak any English okay he had no friends or family there and she had a couple of relatives there and to the best of my knowledge, he was the only one who knew I wasn't real. Oh. I have a feeling he wanted her to believe that she was marrying him. <gasps> and I didn't realize what, I, what was happening until it was done. So when you were finished, what did they say? Or what did he say? He said, great job and paid me, gave me a tip. And I walked away feeling very conflicted. <laughs> <laughs> very strange. <laughs> Did I just marry these people? That's what I walked away asking myself. <laughs> <laughs> How weird. Yep. <laughs> All right, next line. Dave once ate the entire birthday cake at the party he performed at. And that is not true, at least not yet. <laughs> <laughs> But I now have a new goal. <laughs> Here's the next one. Dave once performed as the magician on Amtrak when the train caught on fire. And that is true. 
how, how did you handle that? It was weird. Well, I really didn't have anything to do with it, fortunately. Back in the late 90s, Amtrak's Coast Starlight, which ran from L.A. to Seattle, had a program where they had entertainers on it. And every day, a different performer would, was working the event. So once a month, I would go up to Seattle. It was a four-day trip, two days up, two days back. And I was fortunate enough to be one of the magicians as part of the program. And we were coming back down through Oregon, and it's just kind of farmland. And I was sitting in my cabin, relaxing on break. And I looked out the window, and I see we're in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of farmland. We just start slowing down. And I see this farmer looking at us on his tractor with this shocked look in his eyes. We're slowing down in the middle of this field. And then he gets off his tractor and starts running toward us, and we come to a dead stop. And I'm like, what in the world? So I get out of my cabin and I go to the other side of the, of the crew car and look out the window and there are all these fire trucks hosing down the engine in front of us. Oh. And it turned out that we had two engines. Apparently our second engine had caught on fire. Nobody in the crew knew about it and the engineers didn't know about it because they were in the first engine. And apparently we were catching trees on fire. Oh. So there were fire trucks that had been chasing after us for miles until somebody called Amtrak and said, you guys, the train is on fire, you should pull over. Oh, uh, the Fireball Express. Oh, yeah, the fire. <laughs> All right, next headline. Dave was, quote, unquote, stalked by Natalie Portman. And that is, quote, unquote, true. Mm. Uh, I'm dying to hear this one. And I use the word stalk tongue in cheek. I was performing at the Magic Castle uh, about a year ago, year and a half ago, and Natalie Portman was in the audience. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, she came up and complimented my show. And I said, you know, I've got this Natalie Portman story I've got to share with you. She gives me this creepy fanboy look. And then I told her this true story about how I'd done a, a hypnosis show many years ago. And I had this one woman who was actually a friend of mine hypnotized. And I do an age regression to my show, and I brought her down earlier and earlier and earlier. And at the age of six, I'm interviewing her and asking her who her best friend is, and she's talking about her best friend, Natalie. Oh. And then later on, I, I see uh, her mom, who is also a friend of mine, and her mom says, you know who Natalie was? And I go, no. She goes, that's Natalie Portman. Oh. And Natalie looks at me at that point and says, was that Rachel? And I go, nod, yes. <laughs> and so she was like, oh my gosh, I guess they, they were friends when they were childhood friends. So it was totally a not your normal fan story that she was expecting. That's so strange and coincidental. It was. And it was like, I, I was glad I could finally you know, share that with Natalie Portman. What are the odds of that? So six months later, I'm hired to do a gig uh, with a customer that books me. I show up at this big gated community in Hollywood and I walk in and the assistant who had hired me got introduced, brings me into the house to introduce me to the mom. And the mom says, I look at the mom, I say, nice to meet you. And she says, good to see you again. I turn around to walk away to get my equipment and I go again. And I turn back around and it's Natalie Portman. Oh. <laughs> apparently she liked my show and I made enough of an impression on her that she called the Magic Castle up to find out who I was and get my contact information. Oh. And then, had her assistant call and hire me using a different name because she doesn't use her real name. And so I told her, you're my celebrity stalker. Dang. <laughs> I guess if you're going to be stalked by somebody, Natalie Portman's not so bad. Exactly. <laughs> that was Fact Or something John just made up. Ah. All right, we're going to go into fan questions now. Every time I interview a new guest, I put on my Facebook page that you can ask me questions to ask of our guest. And you have some, some questions here, Dave. Let's go. And you have some fans, fans and questions. Here we go. Brett Bolich, a terrific magician out of the SoCal, asks, David, how were you able to scale your business up over the years with various concepts? I think Brett really wanted to figure out how to shoehorn my name. <laughs> <laughs> such a simple question and yet a whole career to describe the answer i would say scaling but i'm bump my business mm -hmm. if i could summarize the answer it's taking advantage of different opportunities when they open themselves up mm -hmm. as, a, as the beginning of the answer for that so my attitude coming up through the ranks was always 
short of taking off my clothes, I will try anything once. Mm -hmm. And that opened me up to all kinds of different opportunities. It exposed me to character work. And my mentor, who taught me how to do a whole lot of stuff, was a really amazing character performer. And he was the one I, I shared earlier, how he taught me the idea of creating the storyline. Sure. So that parlayed into the different characters. And when the Ninja Turtles took off and I had more work in it than I could handle, that created an opportunity for how can I train other people to work for me? Mm. And so I began to scale that business and I had a whole little army of Ninja Turtle performers. I got a bunch of costumes. I became the guy that most of the event planners went to when they needed Ninja Turtles. And I was sending out performers all day long. And that turned into my for developing the idea of having an agency. Cause that's oh. another thing that I didn't mention earlier. I also have an entertainment agency. From there I began to discover that, wow, I've got a whole lot of connections and other great, amazing performers that I've worked with at all these big events that I've collected their names, maybe I could scale that. Mm -hmm. So I began to market other performers through my agency. All of that kind of evolved over time. As I continued to do other superheroes and other characters, later on, you know, a decade later, I began to realize in my 30s that me and spandex don't get along so well anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I may not be able to be a Power Ranger forever. And I should start thinking in terms of how can I continue my career in a way that will allow me to go into my senior years. Mm. And so I began to think about, I've always wanted to learn hypnosis. So I found a friend of mine who, who mentored me in stage hypnosis and I learned how to put that together. And I began to develop other magic acts that would be more catered toward adults and the grown up audience as a way of knowing that I'm not going to be able to do character work forever. Yeah. So it's all kind of asking yourself, what are the different opportunities out there? What's your big picture strategy? And then taking the steps to make that happen. Brett, great question. Great answer, Dave. And that actually moves us into Annie Banani's question because she asked about your agency. Annie Banani, for people who don't know, she's an amazing balloon storyteller. She asks, I know Dave is an agent as well as a performer, just like you mentioned. Uh, what's the most important things performers should keep in mind when working with an agent? And, and by the way, before you answer this, I know that in, I don't know, eight months or nine months, you're going to be speaking at Performers University uh, about this. But give us a little taste. I, I don't want to give away the whole thing. Ah, boy. How to answer that in a simple thing. I guess the answers are going to be, first, how do you attract an agent and how do you keep an agent? So there, those are two different conversations. It's going to start with having a good product, mm -hmm. making sure that you are really, really good. Because when I look for a performer, I want to make sure they're, they are exceptionally good. And then they've got to also be reliable. So good means they have the skills. Good means they look professional. Good means that they're going to show up. They're going to show up on time. Good. There's a whole ethical discussion about what are the ethics in terms of them marketing to my clients. And I need to be able to trust them not to do that. Then you have the whole pricing strategy that we've got to get into. Are they going to give me a, a wholesale rate that I can mark up and still remain competitive? Or are they going to charge me full price? So by the time I mark it up, I'm going to never be able to sell them. So all of these are things to think about as a performer if you want to market to event planners. That's a whole nother interview, right? Exactly. Maybe we'll do that before Performers University. Maybe we'll have a quick discussion on that and people can get a taste of what you're going to be talking about. That'd be a great idea because I think it'd be really helpful for any performers who want to work with event planners. All right, let's go to Michelle Jar Price. She's the owner and main performer at Science on the Go says... Can you ask him when he's taking us to the Magic Castle? And my answer is, Michelle, I was just there. Where were you? I don't know if she's waiting for an invitation or is she going to call you or what? We got to set something up. <laughs> Michelle's been bugging me about that for a while now. We got to figure out a way to make that happen. All right. So those are our fan questions. Now, Dave, do you have a horror story for us? A horror story? Oh, yeah. Good horror. performing horror story. I know I've got a bunch of them in my pocket. Well, here's one that I was thinking of way back in the early days of my career when I used to do clown shows, clown magic shows. And I had a customer, my own customer, and I was booked at a park. So I show up at a park in my clown costume with all of my uh, equipment, and I'm looking for my party. And this is way before the days of cell phones. And I can't find my party anywhere. And I see a clown performing at a party over there, but there's no other 
there's a couple other parties and I walk up to them and there nobody knows who I am. And finally, the only other party I haven't visited is the one where a clown is performing already. So I walk up to that and I look at the mom and I say, are you so-and-so? And she goes, yeah, who are you? And I told her who I was. She goes, that's you. Then who's that? And she points to the clown performing his magic show. And apparently he had inquired at another event planning company and never booked with them, but they went ahead and sent the clown and he got there before me. So he was, and I had been spent you know, the last 20 minutes walking around this giant park. And finally she realizes that he's not the one he hired. She hired. Did you get to do the party? It, it worked out well. She was mad at him and she goes, I didn't hire you leave. And so he left and then she looks at me and she goes, you know, he already did a show. Why don't you just go and make balloons? And then she gave me. Easy gig. It was. Do you have another one for us? I have one. The worst day in my career, right? and it was only a couple of years ago. Ooh. And this was the only time in my career where I almost gave up on showing up on a gig. And it was, I had done a school show. It was Red Ribbon Week. And you know how crazy Red Ribbon Week gets. Yeah, for anybody who doesn't do schools, Red Ribbon Week is the, the Say No to Drugs Week. It's in late October and it is jam packed with every school in the city or county wanting magic shows and way more work than there are performers. It is crazy. I know I'm completely booked up for Red Ribbon Week. And that also happens to fall during Halloween time. So you fill in Red Ribbon season, with, overlay that with all the Halloween shows and you've got a pretty crazy performer. Yeah. And now some of the schools are adding to that exact same week, Anti-Bully Week. Yeah, I've noticed. So for me, I have an anti-bully show. I have a no drug show. So I get calls for those. It's like, well, can't you just spread it out over the year a little bit for me? You know, there are other weeks in the year. Yeah, exactly. So what happened? Well, I had done a red ribbon show down in San Diego, which is a couple hours away from us. Mm -hmm. I had that evening a big Halloween event that I was going to be performing for. So I go drive all the way back home after my red ribbon show. Everything went fine. And I decide I better start loading up my car. And I go to load up my car and I can't find my equipment. Oh. And I'm in panic mode. Where is my equipment? Where is my big case of all of my magic? Yeah. Best I could figure is I left it at the school in San Diego. Oh no. Yeah. And so I'm in panic mode. And of course they're now closed. Nobody's answering the phones over there. I've got, a couple hours to figure out where my equipment is. And that was a Friday. That next day, I was scheduled to do these huge, huge holiday events for the Long Beach Aquarium of the Pacific and for Honda's corporate headquarters and for the city of Hollywood. It was like these big events. And all of my equipment was mysteriously somewhere at a school in San Diego, probably in the parking lot, which is where I believe I left it. Fortunately, my cousin worked about a mile away from that school. So in a panic, I called him and he was still at work and he drove to the school and he couldn't find my equipment, but he found the janitor and they went through the school and apparently somebody found my equipment and locked him in a closet over there. So he managed to get a hold of my equipment that night. And I'm like, okay, my equipment's safe. Now I've got that. I still have an hour and to put together a show for this show I've got scheduled for this event planner. So I'm panicking, trying to throw together my emergency backup supplies. I've got backups of most of my tricks. So I'm grabbing them out of storage. I'm like, okay, here's this trick. <laughs> oh, it hasn't been touched in 10 years. It's all covered with dust and all the packing material sticking to it. So I'm frantically scraping all that off. <laughs> and I'm trying to come jury rig a, a, a table to put together. And I race down to the to the to the gig yeah. my gps takes me to the wrong location and so i i now have to use my old thomas guide and, the, and it's getting dusk but i bring out the map book for the first time in years and realize that i can no longer see it because my eyes are not good anymore <laughs> Dang! <laughs> and so i freak out and finally i get to the address and it's a big shopping center and i can't figure out which building it's supposed to be in is it this clubhouse or this one so in a panic, I called the event planner who was the face painter at the job, and it's supposed to start in two minutes, and she gives me this huge, horrible attitude of, I'm working, deal with it, <gasps> and then hangs up on me. Oh. And so I walk in there, I finally find it, I'm about six or seven minutes late now because I couldn't tell which building it was in, and then she wouldn't talk to me after that, and actually 
for a long time didn't pay me. She was supposed to pay me on site, but because I was a couple minutes late, I did not tell her all the hell I'd gone through to get there. Of course. She, I, I finally got paid from her right when it was about to get contentious. But for the longest time, she turned that couple minutes late into the most outrageous, horrible overreaction on that. And she had oh. no idea what I'd gone through to get there. <laughs> oh, man. We've all gone through that where we're totally stressed out right before the show. and But we have to put on our smiley little face and say, hi, how are you? Great to see you. Because they don't know what we just went through. Exactly. Life is good. Rainbows and unicorns. Now, tell me about your lecture notes. There are three different sets of your lecture notes. One is, the first one is the biz of booking bazillions of birthday gigs. That one is basically a marketing book. I don't know if you know it. I actually have an MBA in real life in marketing. I've spent the whole career trying to apply that stuff to the basics of what we do, of how to market a theme and entertainer. So I was lecturing at uh, some local clubs and I put together these notes. It's kind of the basics of marketing, how to develop your, your marketing tools, how to write a good advertising piece, how to get that information out to the target your, uh, your customers, mm -hmm. uh, how to figure out who your customers are going to be. Just kind of figuring out how to put together the message and getting it into the hands of those who want to hire you. Now, how about designing amazing and fun magic shows? That goes into a lot of the detail about the stuff we were talking about today. You know, it's all about kind of step-by-step -step process of how to develop your character, how to strategize your routines for different age groups. So if you're dealing with toddlers, you're going to take a different approach than if you're dealing with seven-year-olds, and that's going to be a different approach than dealing with, you know, 12-year-olds. Sure. So you've got to think about developmentally where the kids are and how your material is going to fit that. Mm -hmm. And I talk about different strategies for what works and what doesn't. I talk about how you create your storyline, some of the stuff we touched on today, and creating different themes, kind of uh, putting it all together to create a whole show. And even though it was designed for magicians, most of the material will fit just about any performer who wants to work with kids. Actually, you know, your strategies of creating a character and a backstory and going into the event with that, it seems like it would work for any variety art. Exactly. And that's why it's a real good, powerful tool for anybody who wants to up their game as a kid's performer. Got it. And that's designing amazing and fun magic shows. What about bits, shtick, and routines? So this is a collection of a lot of the different routines and material that I've developed over the years. Most of it is actually not magic. It's the ways I interact with kids that have made me really, really successful as a kid's performer. Mm -hmm. So for example, if I'm working an event and I, like a picnic and I need to round up the kids. I've got different tools where I will round up the kids. And this is just a transcription of that routine. Like here, I'll give you a sample. I'll say, hey, all kids, all kids, come on down, gather around. I need all the big kids, the little kids, the munchkins, the curtain climbers, the linoleum lizards, the ankle biters, the scalawags, the rapscallions, the dirt devils, the dustbusters, the chimichangas, the chupacabras, the chalupas, the chewbaccas, the biohazards, the the snickerdoodles, the jabberwockies, and the Ewoks, and the Jawas, and the gremlins, and this goes on and on and on and on. Cool. So it's all those kinds of shtick and bits and routines that I use both when I'm meeting a kid, both as, as part of a warm-up for a show, um, if I'm doing walk-around entertainment, if I'm trying to round them up. And I also have a section in there for how do I deal with, with challenges. Mm -hmm. What do you do with when you've got the toddler that walks in the middle of your show? Sure. So one of the ones I like with that is if the toddler's walking in the middle of my show, I'll look at them and I'll say, oh, hi, can you go find mommy and daddy and, and tell them you're in trouble? And then I'll go shuffle them off. <laughs> and it never fails. Two minutes later, they come back and I'll say, oh, look, you're back. Can you go find mommy and daddy and tell them that now they're in trouble? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's bits, shtick, and routines. For me, that is a great set of lecture notes because in my particular show, very much like your show, I do five or six tricks and the rest is all being silly, fun, and goofy and having fun with the kids. I come from the school of thought that magic is simply the tool that we use to showcase the performer, which is different than a magician's job is to present magic. Right. When you take that different approach, you realize that the magic is kind of the tool, but the real show is me and my interaction with the performer, with the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Those are terrific. How can someone get a hold of those lecture notes? 
Well, they can visit my website, davidscale.com, D-A-V-I-D-S-K-A-L-E. Theoretically, there should be a page up if I can get it to work right that has the, uh, a link on there and how you could pur- purchase the notes. You can always send me an email, and on my website, I do have my email link. Let me know what notes you want. You can also find me on Facebook at David Scale, D- again, at Scale with a K. Uh, any and all of those are ways to reach me. Well, thanks, Dave, for doing my uh, podcast. It's been really fun. Oh, absolutely. I've been watching you build this thing from scratch, and I know how hard you work, John, and I can't wait to see what this what your podcast is going to look like in just a couple of years with you as at, at the helm. Thank you. I think you're number 27, I think. So we started out at number one. I can't believe we're already up to 27. Goes by fast, huh? It does. I'm loving it. Feels like it's only been 26 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Only <laughs> wait, 26. That's a half a year. Wow. Wow is right. Well, thanks again, Dave, for doing my podcast. Well, absolutely, John. Anytime. And thanks to all my variety artists. If you found this podcast valuable, tell a friend. That's how we can spread the word. Also, make sure to get your free audiobook from audible.com. Just go to the varietyartist.com, get your first book for free. You can reach me at John at thevarietyartist.com or join my Facebook group at The Variety Artist where you can ask me to ask questions of our wonderful guests like my friend Dave. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money and have some fun. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist, but your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist. But until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.